Hello. Thank you. Thank you for being here, everybody. Welcome to this panel, Invest Talk Slovenia 3.0, Trends and Challenges of Global FDI, a Threat or Opportunity. Could I please uh, invite, first and foremost, Zdravko Pocivarsek, Slovenia's Minister of Economic Development and Technology, to conduct the welcome speech. Thank you. Excellencies, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to address you at the Invest Talk Point uh, panel within the 14th, 14th uh, Blade Strategic Forum. It's a fact that foreign direct investments play an important role in economic growth. That's why I'm proud that Slovenia has positioned itself on the world map as a reliable, quality, motivated, and innovative country for business and investments. Investors who are already in Slovenia have recognized this. What's more important? They are willing to expand further. Almost 40% of surveyed companies with foreign capital predict expansion of activities in Slovenia. Slovenia offers a stimulating and stable business environment. The environment with one of the most open investment relations within European Union and OECD. We are committed to improve it even further with proactive reforms. That's why we are constantly taking measures to create a competitive, transparent, simple, and investor-friendly business environment. Therefore, I'm glad to say that foreign direct investment inflow has increased for more than 30% since 2015. The stock of Invart FDI in Slovenia amounted to 15.1 billion euros at the end of 2018. Again, this is 8.6% more than in the previous year. It's more than obvious that we have a clear strategy in attracting FDI. We are open for new investments and further growth. We wish to attract high-tech, knowledge-based, high-value-added investments. We are attracting investments in R&D, uh, where we offer 100% tax relief and supporting environment. We aim to position our suppliers higher in the global value chains and enable them access to new markets. This is crucial for us because export is the main driver of our economic growth. And especially, we would like to work with sustainable and uh, responsible investors, companies which could fit within our values, green, creative, and smart. In this quickly changing world, uh, I'm ex ex excited to learn from all of you and to look from your perspectives. I'm sure our fruitful debate will take into account not only current and future global trends and opportunities, but also regulation frame, questions of national security and public interest. I'm convinced this panel will shed light on all mentioned topics. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to quote Darwin uh, for the end. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. And I think this speaks in our favor. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Could I now invite Dr. James Zahn, Director of Investment and Enterprise at UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. He'll be giving us a keynote speech and a big picture look at what's going on in the world of foreign investment and what we need to adapt to. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sita Chen. First of all, um, I wish to thank uh, the Ministry of Economy and, um, uh, and Technology for this uh, invitation. It's my great honor to be here. And hearing Your Excellency Minister's uh, speech, I, I can only say the congratulations for your leadership, the achievement that you have made in uh, attracting international investment is really remarkable, especially against the backdrop of global FDI decline and, dec and low level over the past 10 years. 40% of the enterprises uh, want to expand investment in, 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 um, in, uh, uh, in your country, as you mentioned. It's really, really impressive looking at the gloomy picture of the, of the years to come. So, start my conversation about global FDI trends, prospects, and the policy developments. First, if you ask me to describe the prospect in one word, I would say good. If you ask me to describe it with two words, I would say not good. And if you ask me to say, well, a bit more, and I can say cautious, optimistic, but with high risks. That's the overall message um, I would like to give in this presentation. Now, this is the, the key elements I, want, I would like to talk about. First, we, we have seen the significant decline of global FDI in three consecutive years, in particular driven by the decline in Europe. And secondly, from a longer term perspective, if we look back for the last decade, uh, the last three decades, and in fact for the last decade, it's characterized by the word saying that too low for too long. And then if you look further, the interrelationship between global value chain, which is backstopped or supported by the expansion of global FDI, and there's, there has been a stagnation of growth of global value chain, and I will explain uh, uh, that with facts and figures. And then currently, what we are experiencing is the restructuring of global value chain, driven mainly by digitalization and trade tensions. And I would call it a kind of competitiveness war rather than trade war by nature and in its prospect. Now, in terms of policies, we see the dichotomy of directions of investment policies at the national level. We see the diversity of of moving forward in the international investment regime development, and we also see the increasing interaction between investment policies and industrial policies. So that is the full picture at global level. This is the summary I put my conclusions up front. Now, global FDI trends, and the diagram shows that global FDI declined for the third consecutive year it declined by 13% in 2018, which was on top of 24% of decline in 2017. So you can see the kind of a drastic decline over the past two years or two to three years. And that is really drastic. Now, global IFDI is now at the lowest level, um, uh, below the midpoint of the, uh, since 2008. And in fact, Global FDI hasn't seriously recovered from global financial crisis in 2008-2009. Now, um, if you look at the prospects, we can see that um, we expect global FDI to increase by roughly 10% as we see the Greenfield investment announcement has increased significantly. We have also seen that in Europe, because FDI decline was too drastic now, there is a sign of recovery of FDI to certain levels. Overall, it's about 10%. Even if we add up this 10% to the existing, existing level of flows, that is 1.3 trillion US dollars, we reach 1.5 trillion US dollars this year. And even for 1.5 trillion US dollars, still below the 10-year average of the last 10 years. So that is what I said not so good if we look at even though the increase of FDI. Having said that, even for 10%, the risks abound. There are many risks that will temper 
such a growth kind of momentum. And that relates to geopolitics, relates to the kind of a risk of economic downturn, relates to escalation of the trade wars, or we call the uh, comp economic competitive wars. Um, so all these pose the risk for the prospects of global FDI. At a regional level, I think you are, you, you are eager to know what's happened with Europe. For Europe, the story was very uh, difficult. And investment flows to Europe declined for third consecutive year. And last year, the decline was 27% and reached the lowest level since 2004. European Union is even worse. Investment flows halved. And the decline was quite significant and reached the lowest level since 1998. Then you may ask why there's a such decline. Uh, in fact, transactions are happening. If you look at the data of cross-border merger and acquisitions, there was still kind of very dynamic and, and a lot of deals happening. The main factor for the decline in Europe was for some European countries that had high level of FDI stock from the United States companies suffered from the repatriation of the accumulated investment earnings that the, such a repatriation of the earnings drag down the investment flows into those countries such like Ireland and Switzerland and, and, and also UK. That, that, that's part of the reason for the European decline of FDI. And, um, and that was triggered by the U.S. tax reforms introduced at the end of 2017. And that happened mainly of the repatriation during the first two quarters of 2018. Basically, over 750 billion U.S. dollars were repatriated from Europe, mainly back to the United States as kind of reversal. Um, that is, that's what happened for the first half of 2018. For the second half of 2018, the situation was, uh, was stabilized because uh, there was kind of a wind up by the U.S. companies of repatriation. In the meantime, U.S. companies started kind of uh, uh, proactively acquiring assets in Europe. So that stabilized and balancing off a bit of the trends. For other regions, developing countries um, weathered the storm well. Investment flows increased by 2%. And um, for, for, for developing countries, as, as a result of its increase, while the drastic decrease of investment into developed economies, developing countries' share of the inflows at a global level reached 54% of historical level uh, high in terms. So developing countries attract more FDI, and developing Asia uh, um, enjoyed increase of FDI by 4%, and it, 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 become, it has been the largest recipient of FDI, far more, far, far more than that of Europe. Uh, so that is the, the scenario. Uh, for Central and European countries, FDI continue to decline because of the decline in Russia. So that is uh, the scenario. I don't have much time, so I just give you a snapshot. Now, the lack of expansion of global FDI affect the global functioning of the global value chain, affect the global value chain. So global value chain growth stagnated. Um, we calculated the foreign value added as a share of the total export, and that is the way to see to what extent that global value chain has been working. And in that sense, we see that between the 1990s and to up to 2000, 2005, 2006, 7, that global value chain growth was very steady um, until 20%, uh, and later on, by the time of 2012, and 2013, it peaked to 31%. And since then, it stabilized and then it declined. Um, and in fact, last year, we're talking about 2018, which is not here, 
that the percentage point has reduced by one. Yeah, so we see a kind of stagnation, now declining slightly. Now the question is, is this the turning point as the current global economy goes, as the economic policy directions are going, so the global value chain is suffering and may continue to suffer, and then we may get into the kind of turning point. So this is the global value chain because that will affect global trade also. As we have seen that the growth rate of global trade has been slowed down significantly if we compare that with the previous decades that the WTO numbers have shown. Now let's look at broader perspective or longer term. Um, in fact, when we see over the past 10, 10 years that there was seven out of the 10 years, seven years of FDI decline and three years of increase, for those years that FDI increased, it was triggered by mega deals or by some kind of a tax inversion, inversion uh, um, uh, incentives. Therefore, um, the FDI increased in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in three years over the past 10 years. If we discount all these mega deals, if we discount on those policy-driven one-off type of factors, in fact, if you look at the FDI, it has been remained stable and at a low level. Um, um, if we compare with longer term, in the 1990s, on average, there was about 20% of FDI growth. If we look between 2000, 2008, before the financial crisis, on average, that was 8% of growth. But now for the current decade, the average growth was only 1%. It's very low, and that shows longer term trend. And I had discussion with the World Bank colleagues de dealing with the global economic uh, prospect, world economic prospects, and for them, they also see that not only the international investment, but investment in general has been stagnated in growth since global financial crisis. So this is a very serious concern. Um, now, I would like to talk about the global value chain restructuring. Uh, the global value, sh value chain is now under restructuring, reconfiguration, driven mainly by two factors. The first factor is the digitalization of the economy, which has changed the behavior of multinational companies and which have changed the nature of the investment and have changed the global pattern of investment. The investment and global value chain used to be driven by traditional companies through the global value chain they call the lead firms that are leading and shaping the global value chain, therefore the investment pattern and trade pattern. What has happened over the past years is that um, the digital firms, the tech firms, are taking over the traditional multinational companies as the lead firms in shaping up the new pattern of global investment, global trade, global value chain. And that characterized by, it, uh, by the footprint light in investment. Therefore, non-equity mode of investment is getting larger share than the traditional FDI, which is the equity, foreign equity investment. So that is why we see in aggregate level, sometimes you see a lower level of FDI, but in fact, the international production activities still going on and intensifying in the non-equity mode that related to franchising, contract manufacturing, contract farming, so on and so forth. And also leasing is coming in. For example, a lot of investors investing in the home country, in the host country, instead of purchasing the, manuf uh, the, the manufacturing equipment installed in the country, they lease. By leasing and, and by the, the manufacturers providing the equipment and doing the service instead of the investors themselves, so on the book count, this capex, traditionally we call it capital expenditures have, became, have become um, OPEX, operational expenditures. Therefore, in terms of FDI numbers, it doesn't show that, it shows differently. But having said that, 
foreign investors play an important role in, 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 in building the productive capacity in the countries, <coughs> generate jobs, and contributing to the tax. All these things are unchanged except for the FDI number at global level. So this shows, graph shows that, that this drastic change. Now let me come to policy uh, changes. Um, I would characterize the policy from the changes into four Ds. Dynamics in policy making at, at the national and international levels, dichotomy in regulatory directions for national policies, divergence in international investment treaty approaches, and dilemma in investing in sustainable development, in particular sustainable development goals. Now first, dynamics in policy making, we see that countries are still actively in reform of this, their investment regimes. And in that, they introduce new policy changes. But the directions are changing. That's the graphs on the left has shown that um, the, the dichotomy is happening. So in fact, in the, in the 1990s, at the beginning of the century, that the investment, uh, the, the investment policy introduced are mainly in the direction of liberalization, facilitation, promotion of investment. And only 5% on average of the policy changes were in the direction of regulation and restriction. And that picture has changed by the time of last year. One third of the policy changes were in the direction of restricting FDI and regulating FDI, tightening up, including screening and monitoring of foreign investment. And despite the fact that two thirds of the policy changes are still in the direction of investment promotion and facilitation. But that happens mainly in developing countries. For advanced countries, it's more of introducing regulatory restrictions. So the dichotomy is really showing um, in this sense. Um, the same country, on the one hand, intensified efforts to promote investment and liberalize and facilitate investment, uh, at the same time putting in place restrictive measures to, investment, to international investment. So that's what's happening both at international and national levels. Now, international investment regimes, there's no multilateral investment regimes, unlike the trade regimes in WTO and, um, and, and the monitor regime, IMF. But there is an international investment regime which is highly fragmented, highly atomized. It consists of 3,400 investment treaties concluded by countries at bilateral, regional, sub-regional, and inter-regional levels. That constitute the international investment regime is under reform. At this stage, there are different, different types of approaches for, for that. And some countries are going for higher level of, of protection and promotion, while some countries trying to walk away from the, from the regime, trying to terminate investment treaties, and still other countries trying to reform. The regime. So things are happening, it's kind of highly contentious, contentious um, issue and area. But overall, we see the trends of countries are now improving their investment climate, following the package that UNCTAD uh, introduced as a reform of international investment regimes. And, and indeed, we see the emerge of a new generation of investment policies that are more towards the sustainable development. So that is the now, another point about investment industrial policies, I think I have a time limit. Um, for industrial policies, we see the proliferation. Now, industrial policies back in fashion. Um, we have documented that over 101 countries now have industrial policies, explicitly industrial policies. And this is really from the most advanced countries to the least developed countries uh, that they have industrial policies. Um, and those industrial policies, we see that over 85% of the industrial policies were introduced in the last four to five years. So this is a new generation of industrial policies. The main feature of such industrial policies, the new generation, is that it's open. It's opening approach rather than a kind of traditional one, import substitution approach. And for this new industrial policies, we see closer interaction between investment policies and industrial policies, and investment policies becomes a kind of instrument for achieving industrial policies. Through different investment policy instruments, such as incentives, 
investment liberalization of restriction, restriction measures, facilitation, special economic zones, and so on and so forth. So there is a close interaction between the two. That's what we see that the industrial policies are now guiding the investment policies, and investment policies are following industrial policies and implementing industrial policies. So that is the overall, and, and I've already put my com conclusion up front. We see the prospects for FDI is all cautious, optimistic, risks are abundant, and we see the trade war is threatening the growth of FDI, um, and also we see the kind of a possible turning point of globalization as manifested by the slowdown of trade, stagnation of GVC growth, and stagnation of FDI growth. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. It's very informative. Could I now invite our esteemed panelists to the stage, beginning um, with uh, Alesh Kantaruti, State Secretary for Slovenia's Ministry of Economy, uh, sorry, uh, yep, Slovenia's Ministry of Economy, followed by Dr. Ra uh, Res Restislav Chobanek, State Secretary of Slovakia's Ministry of Economy. Thank you. And Mia Polak, Acting Head of Office in Slovenia for the, for the EBRD. Mr. Bostan Skala, Executive Director for WIPA, w, uh, World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. Mr. Luke, Luca Vesnavar, Partner in Charge of Financial Advisory Services for Deloitte, Slovenia. And Professor Valerio De Luca, President and Founder of Global Investors Alliance and Pro-Chancellor and Visiting Professor at the University of Kigali. Thank you. And Dr. James Zan, please. Thank you. Thank you. Following on from uh, that big picture look at global foreign investment trends, I thought we'd just unpack a little more as to what on earth is going on and why we're seeing this rather gloomy three-year decline and last year being the worst year for global foreign investment since the financial crisis, which is it's not a good sign, is it? Um, so could some of our panelists maybe beginning, beginning with Alesh, um, unpack a little more as to as to what this means for Europe, how it's impacted Europe or um, Slovenia. Begin as you were, as you wish, and, and what's going on with this uh, three-year decline. And first of all, thank thank you for the question and welcome. Uh, if you ask me what this means for Europe, uh, the answer is clear: nothing good. Why? Because um, okay. Let's go to the Brussels for a moment. Let's go to the uh, uh, sessions of the compet uh, competitive um, sessions that we go together with Rastomir are many times there, where the ministers for economics uh, more or less are there. And uh, what I can tell you is the constant uh, saying from the uh, Commissioner Biankowska, look, guys, we have to be more active, we have to be proactive, we have to do more if we want to catch the other global, uh, let's say, strong economic centers. Firstly, meaning, of course, United States, then, of course, Asia, China, and others. Uh, and uh, that is the truth. We have to work uh, more, we have to, more, uh, we have to cooperate more, uh, and especially, of course, we have to be more active in the uh, research, uh, um, looking for new solutions, uh, looking for new ideas, for new, for new uh, of course, uh, directions. Now, what is going on is also that it's a, the, the common uh, knowledge that we are living in, in disruptive times. That means, for instance, automotive industry, we still don't, today don't know whether we will go in 10 years to the electricity or we will go to the hydrogen, and these are disruptive uh, technologies that are uh, uh, 
plunging all the sectors, the, the, the crucial sectors in, or many crucial sectors in Europe uh, as such. And in this, that's why we need more knowledge, more uh, joining forces so that we will be successful in coping these challenges. Now, the second is also something that is going in uh, not good in our favor, let's say, is also the, it was not mentioned, but I think it's a very important factor, uh, the uh, um, population. What is going on in Europe, what is going in other places, and of course, um, in Europe Union, we have the problem, and uh, all many other countries have the similar problem. Uh, the population is shrinking. There will be less and less Europeans, let's say. Uh, and this, of course, is a, a real threat. And if you ask me why uh, also we don't have such big growth, or where is the growth in the global world, of course, we can create growth through new ideas, through new solutions, and uh, this is the right one, but you can also create a growth with the bigger populations, with the new people, with the new, uh, let's say, consumers. And here the power lies on the other centers of the global, let's say, uh, this uh, world. Uh, that's why I think that uh, there's only one solution uh, for us in order to turn these uh, uh, charts up, is to work uh, more to have more, let's say, joint programs that we have inside of the European Union um, and to create, let's say, also new models that will attract the, uh, let's say, investment from other parts of the world. Uh, something was mentioned by the professor. Uh, it is the new uh, business models that m maybe we are not used to it, uh, that uh, companies do not invest, but they outsource also some, let's say, operations that it was unimaginable to uh, do like this. But today, when we are looking for the uh, uh, bigger competitiveness, companies also do this. And this is, let's say, these are the challenges that we, ha we have to discuss about and that we have to look for the uh, suitable solutions. Thank you. And we'll come back to Europe in, in a moment and the question of population, maybe immigration as a plus side for that. But if we're going to remain on the global um, context for now, um, Dr. Zhang, could you just, I, I meant to follow up on this. Is, is, glo is, is foreign investment changing? Do you think it will continue to change as this policy-driven decline continues in ongoing years? Are we reaching the limits of globalization, as people like to put it? And does that mean foreign investment is going to continue to change and therefore decline as, as it seems that this policy-driven phenomenon will only, will only continue with the likes of President Trump, other actors around the world who are, who are, who are disrupting what we knew before? Through, through a number of means. Yeah, I think you, uh, Sebastian, you captured the key word, policy, policy driven. You captured the key word, policy driven. Indeed, the current global investment trend is mainly policy driven, and um, the investment flows is mainly um, investment diversion rather than investment generation or expansion. So these are the two key. Um, phenomenal kind of key messages. It will continue. It will continue as we see, we can envisage that this current, the trade tension will not substitute, but will, uh, may have kind of a risk of a further uh, escalation. So um, after all, as I said from the very beginning, it's not a war of trade. It's only part of that. It's a war of competitiveness. It's a war of economic war. It's trade investment, technology, and overall. And the problem is that there could be a further kind of uh, uh, escalation going into other areas. So this economic cold war will be kind of serious uh, kind of concern by then. So that's why it will continue to drive the reconfiguration of global, uh, global uh, GVC, uh, the, the GVC and, 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 and uh, global international production network. What we have seen so far is that investment is flowing from China, part of the investment divesting from China, to South and Southeast Asian countries, that is to Vietnam, to Indonesia, to the Philippines, for example, uh, in the Southeast Asia, and to, to, to South Asia, like Bangladesh, India, so on and so forth. But those regions have limited absorbed capacity for FDI. It's because of their um, infrastructure, because of their human resources, 
for upgrading uh, the skilled labor shortage is getting bigger and bigger now. And there's um, um, like electricity supply and the raw materials, and there's a lack of kind of a bigger cluster like what is good, what China has. So this reaching the, the absorptive capacity for FDI may have the multinationals to, con to consider for alternative venues. Where can that be? Africa has this limit, but South and Southeast Europe may be another alternative. And, um, and that's what we see the possibility of, of the global value chain moving. So that's what we see policy driven is continue. This policy driven is more of, uh, of what we say that uh, kind of uh, the rising tension driven, so to speak. Thank you. Any thoughts on, on why this is happening, the decline, and where we're going? Anyone would like to chip in on that? I might. Uh, I would like to maybe give a look from the micro perspective of some of the companies, because uh, I think right now we are in, in, in the times where with the fourth industrial revolution, where uh, some savings and optimization doesn't have to come from relocating to cheaper labor force or cheaper countries, but something with the smart industry and automatization, these savings can be done within the existing uh, uh, companies or within the existing premises. So that's why I believe that just the quality of uh, uh, of the exchange of capital will not be will not be driven by FDIs. For, for a short period of time, but maybe a lot of uh, money will go to R&D, and R&D stays in the home uh, country of those companies. So that's uh, part of the reason that I believe uh, impacted the FDI inflow is that the optimizations and the cost cutting or um, cost savings can be done even within the existing premises. But And then uh, you have another factor that was not mentioned, that's the, that's the all kinds of would say threats that are within the economy. Look at the Brexit. If I would be a company from UK, I have no idea for the last two years if we are going to leave EU or not. If I want to invest in EU or not. So the the I would call it a stress factor that is caused by the uncertainty is so high that many companies are waiting for the new approach. But I don't think that the situation is negative. It was shown by the professor that uh, there are different optimistic ways how to look at the FDI decline because of the rise of m and et cetera, et cetera. That it's just a small step when going to another level. Thanks, for example, this uh, Industry 4.0, new, new automatizations. Also, yeah, maybe a <coughs> few thoughts on, on this. Um, w what is interesting, it was mentioned also from Professor Jean that uh, digitalization is, let's say, an area which is basically going against the general trend of declining FDI. That's also what we see doing transactions in, in, in the region and also over Europe. So uh, looking, let's say, the perspective of Central and Eastern Europe, including Slovenia, so w what we observe is that basically the whole region has been moving from an area where the competitive advantage were attractive wages, like in Slovakia, for example, 10 years back. So a lot of investment was based on price competitiveness. Yeah. The whole region has been moving from that area into an area where also we're, we have become very competitive in terms of skills. And skills are the one element, what was mentioned before, was what is the consumption capacity of countries like Vietnam, you know, how much FDI can they consume. And this will very much be driven in the future if you have properly skilled labor force that can actually, you know, build on, on, on the FDI that is... Uh, directed toward the digitalization, this, the, the linked industries, yeah, then you have the capacity to absorb this FDI. And, and this is what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe, that basically on the value chain of production, uh, the whole economy is luckily moving a step upwards. Yeah. And that's what we've also seen in countries like Spain, which have attracted a lot of FDI in the past, digitalization. So the new technologies are an area which definitely are working against the, the, the traditional industries which, where we've seen a decline in FDI. Yeah. But, but this is definitely an area of skills are one of the key factors of future FDI. Yeah. Right, so yeah. less, a less gloomy perspective there. Any other thoughts um, on, this, on this? Before we move on, um, on this global context, why we have a decline? Is it that bad for Europe? Where do we see thing going, th things going? Bo Boss Chen, any thoughts on that perhaps? Or Professor De Luca, as you wish? I guess the um, talent is also the buzzword. So we are saying we would like to have and create an environment that will uh, give the opportunity to investors to invest. And then 
we see all around the world that uh, countries are facing the brain drain, so-called, or there is no enough experts which will create the environment where the investors will invest. So I guess this is one of the big challenges. And one of, let's say, I would say the developed countries are already putting a lot of attention into it to develop uh, some kind of inflow of uh, right experts to their countries to be able to attract appropriate investments, which is in line with SDGs and all the sustainabilities. Uh, the EU is the world's largest and open uh, investment regime. Uh, the EU mechanism, screening mechanism, the aim is not to uh, limit or restrict this regime, but is to protect and attract and foster investment. I think that uh, is the first time that we can reach the uh, national interests through the multilateral cooperation based on shared information. So it's so important to understand that uh, this, uh, um, this EU uh, new regime is, uh, is going to affect and to uh, implement and to protect their, our liberal order from some specific sectors that are an impact on uh, essential interest and security and public order. So it's important to understand the key of uh, the nature of uh, this, uh, this uh, regulation and the role of technology that is, the, is changing the nature of the global chain investments is changing and reshape and redefine the relationship between people, business, government, and civil society. And uh, if you don't look at these two change, and if you don't understand that Europe will be central in that regulation, in, for example, EU privacy regulation, and how all things are linked, we don't understand that, uh, that uh, the role that can play Europe in this global scenario. We'll come back to the digitalization of global value chains in a moment, but you began by talking about the EU uh, foreign investment screening um, mechanism. So just actually, I'd be interested to know, can I just have a little show of hands? Who, who's aware, well aware of the EU's screening mechanism, which began, the process began in 2017? Can I get a, all those who are aware of that screening? Okay. See, that the fact that it's not in a lot of people, and then this is not a, a, a comprehensive survey, is it? But it, I don't think it's, it's in people's minds, um, for better and for worse. So um, basically in 2017, um, Jean-Claude uh, Juncker proposed that we start screening foreign investment. And this is a global trend. It's not just, I mean, it's happening in the US, um, it's happening in China. And in fact, perhaps Dr. Zan could just give a very brief um, overview of, of the rise of foreign investment screening, which is, you could argue, a form of protectionism. Maybe we can debate that. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, according to our survey, that um, quite a number of countries have recently introduced uh, uh, investment screening and monitoring uh, mechanisms, and uh, still other countries are coming in. Uh, not only EU has introduced, but EU member states themselves are also considering introducing or have introduced uh, the, the, the sc investment screening mechanisms. At a global level, what, what we have done is that we look at um, global uh, mega deals that deals above uh, 50 million US dollars and that, that was supposed to go through and didn't go through. Um, so last year, we, we saw 22 such mega deals that have failed to go through um, this procedures. And that the, 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 the combined value of these mega deals uh, was about 150 billion US dollars. It's more than 10% of the global FDI flows. But it, due to the, um, the screening and the monitoring uh, uh, procedures that they, they failed to go through, um, some of them due to the national security reasons, others competition concerns, still others because of the prolonged the review uh, procedures and the expanded scope of the review that it failed to go through. So altogether, we see the impact of all this screening. But Sebastian, you are ex absolutely right. Uh, whether this is a investment protectionism or this is a legitimate right for, for regulate, 
and this is subject to discussion. So, and the investment protectionism is in the eyes of the beholder. Right. And there's no international definition on that. No international consensus on definition of investment protectionism. It's the same for trade protectionism. There's no definition for that. Thank you. Any strong opinions on whether the EU screening mechanism or is, 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 is worth it? Do we need to be protecting certain strategic sectors from, say, Chinese investment? How important is this for Europe? Or perhaps you'd like to talk specifically for your countries in a moment. Any thoughts on that, perhaps? Uh, well, I mean, when it comes to technology, uh, artificial intelligence, that raises a potential for dual use. That makes sense. Um, however, again, this can be abused, obviously, very quickly for political reasons. No? Um, to limit trade again. Hmm. I mean, Dr. Zan was saying that 10% of, of global, I believe 10% of global FDI was, was deterred um, as a result of the screening. Am I right in saying that? So, mm -hmm. so I mean, that's a huge amount. It's a huge amount of investment that <coughs> didn't go through because we're worried about countries like, it always comes down to the demonization of China, excuse me, but it, countries like China who may be, may be uh, unfairly using investment as a means of taking technology. Um, Dr. De Luca, you, you, it sounded like you are very in favor of the EU screening mechanism. You said it's a, it'll be a good way of sharing information and because this, isn't, this is an optional uh, framework. It's not like every country in the EU has to adopt certain measures. I, I believe it's optional, you can opt in. Um, and what it's trying to do is just encourage sharing of information, if I'm right. So, in fact, perhaps would one of our um, state secretaries like to elaborate on what that means, if anything, and maybe that's a point, to, to their relative countries? I think <clears throat> uh, I'm in favor of, uh, I will just <laughs> state it up front, I'm in favor of uh, this screening because it gives you another instrument how to potentially fight against the unfair competition. Because we have to understand that uh, right now money is not an issue. Everybody has a lot of money, <laughs> except maybe the people, but the companies, the states, the European Central Bank is just issuing money. China has a lot of money. And that's why some of the acquisitions or investment are not done purely on an econom economic uh, ba basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes if uh, you allow competitors to buy your company and shut it down or to buy the company, take the intellectual property, you are losing it in a long-term horizon. So that's why having an instrument to maybe don't allow to lose some of the intelligence that you created in your country or your own company is uh, definitely helpful. On the other hand, uh, I think there it was done a lot of good work in decreasing the administrative barriers in, I would call them, regular investment. When uh, uh, EU has done also a lot to make it easier, for example, to give investment incentives to some specific companies. A lot of uh, measures have been done to make it very easy to come to the, an, another country and start a company. So, and, and this probably offsets some of the, I, would, I, I don't even want to call that the negative effect of investment screening because as we have anti-monopoly offices, that's why we have also this screening uh, measures that can be helpful for the country. Because I don't want, or you as a person don't want to sell something that is very valuable and it will hurt you in the long term. Mm -hmm. Because you are not always um, uh, interested based on the economic interest. There are so many political and other issues that are taken into consideration. Okay. Uh, maybe I will add for Slovakia. We have not adopted this measure yet. We are thinking about it. We are. We don't have that many uh, Slovak companies that would be a target for by foreign uh, investors to, to acquire some intellectual property, but uh, eventually, and that's my personal opinion, we will get, get, get it and we will probably start screening the few, or to have an option to screen some of the investment. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I agree completely with colleague Rastomir. Also, the case of Slovenia is similar. We don't have it uh, so far, but we are monitoring carefully. We are preparing, of course, if this uh, the uh, situation will show that it is uh, wise to adopt it. Uh, but the fact is, uh, Slovenia always support, uh, let's say, free trade 
also when we talk about investment, because this is the only way that smaller countries, smaller nations can be competitive. This is the fact. Uh, but when we come, of course, to the, let's say, very uh, specific uh, sectors, sectors uh, which, which are, of course, knowledge-based, with a certain knowledge that maybe only we have, or we are one of the rarest, and this is the, of course, asset that we have to monitor carefully what is going on with this, then, of course, such mechanism could be appropriate. But uh, as I see, this is the way or the kind of protectionism in the foreign uh, investments. Uh, but on the end of the day, if everybody is doing this uh, on the other global centers, I have in mind, of course, and the United States also, and of course the Asia with the China, then we have to be prepared for such uh, actions also in Europe. Thank you. And Boss Chan, um, you, you, you know, you, you're the person to talk to when it comes to investment promotion agencies around the world. What are you seeing in terms of countries? So investment, um, for those who don't know, excuse me if this is uh, patronizing, but the investment promotion agencies are, are, are government agencies which, of course, do exactly what it says on the, on the can. They promote investment and so they reflect government policy. To what extent are you seeing IPAs pick up um, investment screening? You can start with Europe or maybe give us a global context. Let me first say that I would agree that screening is good, especially if we think what was said yesterday. We are trying to protect our planet. We are trying to protect our future. So in this context, of course, the screening would be good and would bring sustainable investments. But on the other hand, when you ask, for example, some least developed countries, some African countries, they would tell me when I ask them, so if we uh, regulate everything, so we will not even get the investments. Our governments are pressing on to us to bring the investments. So even if they are not really in favor of our economy. Uh, I, when you see the list of the countries that are dealing with it or they implement it, are mostly developed ones. Because they are not... Uh, in so big need of investments, so they are already developed. So that's why uh, they would like to get the best possible, the most sustainable investments into their countries. But when you look to more developing, or let's say especially least developed countries, then if they put some certain regulations, um, I, I don't think it will be in line with their politicians, which they want to attract as much as possible investment. So when we speak with IPAs, I don't know if James will agree, they are not really so much aware of this screening. Even the European ones, as, as we see, how many, eight we said before, are already dealing with it. Even the Netherlands is still checking. The colleague from Slovak Republic is saying that they are still checking. So it's not really, I guess, a common sense that this will be implemented. Mm -hmm. Although, I guess, when we consider the sustainable development, some certain... Uh, checkpoint should be done, I guess. If, if, I, if I may, Bastian, um, this debate of screening or monitoring uh, stems from already at the time of 2000, the year 2000, where um, this cross-border measure acquisitions reached a peak level. So the discussion about this, what is cross-border merger acquisition? And even further back during the Asian financial crisis when uh, Krugman called it uh, fire sales, and when the Asian uh, banks and the firms are in, in difficulties, and so assets in distress are up for, for sales. I was touring in those countries and then giving advice, so we discussed the pros and cons. First and foremost, when foreign companies acquired the, the, the firms of other countries, they become the firms of that country subject to the regulatory framework and the regulations of that country. So it becomes your firm rather than their firm. That's one factor. Secondly, if you look at when firms, they want to sell because they want more capital or they want to exit, they need someone to take it over. The more takeovers, the more bidders for the takeovers, the more you can benefit from this cross-border major acquisitions. In the case of Asian financial crisis, there was lack of buyers. Therefore, you had fire sales. 
So the firms will sell, sell at kind of very below the market level uh, of, of the prices. So that's also a factor that needs to be taken into account. Having said that, we fully recognize this, um, the right regulator of the government. And there's a need for regulating foreign <coughs> investment in terms of environmental, uh, both Chen said, environmental, social factors, and even economic factors. I fully understand technology issue is a concern. But by acquiring the technology, the technology is still in the country, home country, host country. If the foreign investors want to acquire and, and bring it back to the home country, that's a different issue. I said it could be subject to different laws and regulations to check. So screening monitoring is not the only means of dealing with the issues. There are alternatives that to deal with the issues, to cover the concerns in the meantime, to maximize the benefit, potential benefits of that. So it's a complexity because cross-border market acquisitions is a way of capacity saving. So if the firm is subject to either to sell or to bankrupt, what, what's your choice as a government if you reach to that stage? So the, the issue is very complicated. And then I think it's, it's good for government to look case by case. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts on the subject, Dr. De Luca? It's true that when a company is acquired by another companies, foreign companies, they are subjected by the rules of that state. But sometimes the lack of reciprocity and the lack of transparency from the, 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 the state origin of the, that company put a lot of risk. You could imagine what happened if, uh, for our playing level field in Europe, if uh, a state-owned companies acquire a, an important share, also minimum, but also significant share of some, some uh, companies that uh, are, are provide essential resources, such as uh, energy, transportation, transportation, logistic, what would happen? So I know that is a balance of risk, but there are specific cases, and other cases, a uh, company that come from tax events, you know, who knows who is behind. So we don't, I think that uh, we, uh, our culture in, uh, in Europe is ordo-liberalism. We want to protect the real, not uh, want to protect like Trump administration. And uh, so we want that there is transparency, reciprocity, uh, uh, and respect of the minimum but essential rights uh, to establish companies and, uh, and so on. And uh, I think that another important good effect could be the sharing of best practice information, experience among different uh, regional uh, economic uh, uh, zone. I mean, we can share maybe with Emirates, with China, with uh, Singapore, different experience to improve this kind of information. So not only within Europe we can exchange information, but also we can cooperate at different level for a race to the top, not to do the bottom. Because otherwise, if you try to escape for some regulation, of course. So I agree with you that it's complicated, but it's also a matter of risk that you have to keep in this very uh, complicated and complex time. And I agree with you when yesterday the, the two presidents said that we have to save the, our future and the Europe will be, come back to be central on your, um, sustainable development uh, to guarantee a future of the next generation. And uh, so it's a challenge that to go behind the cycle of economic business is something uh, is a challenge, I think. So that's. If I may, I think this is really critical. Um, for this session, I'm, I've been to quite a few discussion on this over the past year, but I thought this session is very good uh, in depth. In a sense, the first and foremost, there's a legitimate right for the government to regulate. That's, I have 100% supporting that. The question is how to regulate it. So there are smart regulations, ways of regulating, minimize the negative impact, maximize the potential benefit. That is, that's the way. 
Now, post regulation used to be the option for advanced countries. So you have a liberated regime for, for investors to come in, but you have a full kind of sound regulatory framework, competition policy, environmental policy, social policy, to deal with that. And but there was the failure, lessons learned for tax policies, of course. Now it's getting back, the BEPS, the, the G20, OECD, all working on that. So the post-regulatory model perhaps is better than a kind of pre-established model, which developing countries are now moving from the pre-established regulation model to the post-regulatory model, strengthening the competition policy, the investment facilitation, um, social, environmental policy, labor policy, while for some developed countries going to the other direction. So I'm just seeing that the trends is going on. After all, I would say right to regulate is a principle. Uh, that's the government's right and the obligations. Secondly, we need smart regulation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zan. Any last thoughts on this subject before we, we move on to go, or rather go back quickly to um, global value chains? Um, the idea that, or rather the fact that they are to some extent fragmenting or changing, evolving, and, and what does that mean for foreign investment? Are we moving into a more regionalized world of foreign investment where Asia does more within, within Asia, et cetera, et cetera? Et cetera. Um, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, gentlemen, any, who would like yeah. to kick us off there? Yeah. For this, there are two, uh, two factors I wish to point out, which hasn't been discussed uh, a lot regarding this um, uh, AI or the new industrial revolution impact on global value chain. One is that uh, we see the technology advancement that makes the production, international production, automated or uh, AI uh, in uh, in a kind of viable way. Um, but we see certain industrial activities which are technolog technologically feasible but economically not necessarily viable. So one need to think when we have the AI, when we have the this new industrial revolution, there are activities that economically may not be viable, even though technologically feasible. There are a lot of activities like that. In particular, the high value added labor intensive and high skill intensive uh, industrial activities. Even our suits, for example, for some parts. That's why certain industries in Italy still competitive, even though they are labor intensive, but they are high value added and skills embedded into that. Manufacturing of shoes for people, for men, fashion shoes, things like that. So there is some, this factor we need to get into, uh, to, to keep in mind. Um, secondly, because of the massive deployment of industrial robots, millions of them yearly into the manufacturing sector, there is a shortage of engineers to maintain these robots, and there's some less need for labor. That may slow down the kind of industrial transformation and uh, moving of the industries, some labor-intensive industries, from Asia to Africa. So that flying geese initially we envisage may slow down, and some of the industrial activities may remain in advanced countries advanced the developing countries and where the skilled labor is relatively cheaper. And for this region here, there's competitive advantage for that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, that this whole phenomenon is, a good, is good news for Europe since, frankly, Europe somewhat missed the tech ship. Let's be honest, most tech is coming out of, Euro of the US or Asia. Europe has, has a lot, I mean, think of the unicorns that are that are in, I mean, we have Spotify and other companies, but not so many, right? So what does Europe have that's really advantageous? It's, it's advanced manufacturing. And this region is, is a good example of that. Central Europe as well, of course. Um, and, and I believe that there is an ongoing and an increasing trend 
of backshoring as manufacturing becomes more and more advanced we won't need to we won't need to invest so much in say vietnam we can produce in slovenia or slovakia and be closer to the consumer at home um, because a, it's becoming cheaper and etc i mean it's an obvious argument so are we seeing who would like to pick up this this thread um please uh. yeah. so maybe uh, i'd comment a bit when i was you know looking at our internal materials for this panel, uh, I came upon a Deloitte survey of companies, global survey, and there's a few facts in there which are quite interesting I'd like to bring to attention. One is that the ask was to various managers, you know, in terms of investment, what are the top factors when companies decide to invest in another country, region, territory? So the, and, and four out of five are basically of regulatory nature. So taxation system, rule of law, general safety, um, regulatory transparency. And the fifth one was uh, uh, skills, what I mentioned before, so technology skills. Yeah, so, and, and that's where I think still, and, and the other outcome was that the developing countries in terms of FDI stock are still leading. Yeah, so US, Europe, uh, Asia. Yeah, so of course there's much higher growth in, in, the, in, the, in the emerging markets, yeah, uh, but still the bulk of stock is between the, the, the more developed countries. I hope that doesn't that's contradict. True. Yeah, no, yeah. No, that's true. And, and, and the developed world in terms of these five top criteria they take off all the boxes yeah? whereas in countries like africa you have issues with you know rule of law transparency all that and, and that deters investors so there it's more of a focus on low skill or some specific areas based on which investors would decide yeah? the other area which i think is interesting is uh, um, in terms of the there's a paradox in the fdi landscape uh, based on you know the, the survey we did and that is so-called Island, islandization, so meaning that due to all this protectionism, nationalism that's going on, yeah, so investors are looking much more and more into the specific advantages of certain regions or even cities, so large metropolitan areas. So in Asia, in Europe, yeah, so it would, it would not only go down to the fact how attractive is a certain country, but they would more be looking at the metropolitan area of Shanghai or, or, or London, whatever. So that's, it's also a trend which has risen from the recent changes that we've seen in the in the in the whole in the whole of the FDI store in recent years with all these you know measures being implemented so there's a way which uh, investors have or let's say a turn in the in the in the how investors are are thinking uh, uh, when they decide uh, so this is this paradox of islandization as, as it was named would uh, would Alesh or oh, no, sorry Boshdan yeah. would like uh, what we see is that um, it goes more and more into regional focus. Uh, I would agree 100% also the decision making of investments is seeing the particular region stable. So cooperation between the countries and also then the value chains and the supply chain and everything. Because even if you see the Greta Thunberg, she's going with the boat. If we will all start to go with the boats, we will not travel. So it should be more in region. It will be, I don't know, less emissions and everything. So obviously that these decisions are slowly going into this direction as well. So more regional focus and more close, <coughs> let's say, distances. Uh, let me explain what is going on also in this uh, region, let's say here, Slovenia, also Slovakia, I assume, uh, with the one case that is really fresh. Just a couple of days ago, we got the confirmed information that we lost in Slovenia one quite important big investment from the pharmaceutical industry. Now, what happened? Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, this company, multinational, they already decided that they will build in Slovenia for one uh, drug, let's say. They already started. They already built a facility, invested quite a lot of millions of euros. But suddenly they decide in headquarters, of course, that they will drop this investment. Now, what happened? What happened is they, they find out the new way to produce this drug, the new receptor, the new technologies, the new knowledge about this, how to be more efficient. And they dropped investment in Slovenia, where, of course, we have a limited knowledge about this. And they moved this, I assumed that they will move this, let's say, operation to somewhere else where the, there are more knowledge about the new, let's say, uh, ways how to produce this drug. Now, what tells us this? It tells us that we should not sleep, that we should not 
uh, be satisfied with this that we have right now, but we should work constantly on research, development. We should invest, that Rastomir already mentioned, in this R&D uh, sector. And this is not something that it's, uh, that it's clear that, okay, now reindustrialization is coming. Now, uh, again, the opportunities are here for this uh, 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 region. Yes, if we will be competitive with our knowledges, with our research, with our, uh, let's say, uh, student programs, with everything, this is, uh, of course, one system, uh, that the ecosystem that is very broad. Uh, and, of course, in the end of the day, uh, many times already was mentioned here in this discussion, uh, com competences, uh, where we are, good, where we are not. Uh, uh, this, this case really showed us that we have to work very, very strong in order to gain uh, more competitiveness. Thank you. However, this story might actually have a very good uh, ending because the, uh, this vacant factor effectively may be uh, reused as a, uh, by, uh, for a lithium-ion battery uh, plant. Uh, so again, this is uh, the manifest of, uh, of, a, of a local company that is uh, uh, expanding their, their know-how. Uh, and then again, with uh, resources of uh, let's say, uh, local financial sector, or let's say even EBRD, uh, it would be uh, a great opportunity to actually support this kind of uh, project and put uh, uh, this particular municipality on, on, uh, on, a, on a map for a different reason. And this would be a, a great opportunity. Did you hear that? Anybody? Great opportunity there? Advanced manufacturing in Slovakia and backshoring or regionalization. <laughs> Uh, I think Europe is in a difficult position right now because our main competitors are homogenic countries. U.S. is, you know, everybody speaks English and they have the same like, big, big nation. China, even worse because they can make the decision based on the orders sometimes and they don't have to go through very complicated process of commenting by NGOs and, and so on. In the uh, EU we have 28 countries with different interests, different language, very similar uh, laws, but sometimes not cooperating well. I think one of the issues is that the EU has not decided what we want to do. We are talking at the Competitiveness Council about AI. Cool, I agree, that, that's fine. But on the other hand, we were not still able to adapt the uh, industrial policy of, of EU or to, to bring it into, into practice. Uh, that's one, one issue. The other issue is that um, and maybe this will be a controversial opinion, but uh, I think that EU got, or EU, Europe, European countries got lazy. Uh, if, you, if you look at the investors in, or in uh, countries like China, they are, they are progressing very, very quickly, and the EU was uh, having a very good period of time, very rich period of time, and we kind of lost track and lost the motivation to, to do something. And even if we come up with a great idea, the, uh, for example, in startup uh, uh, businesses, we are quickly, or European companies are quickly bought by American ones and they are going to US. Because we don't have that drive and we are sometimes over-regulated, that's true, and we just cannot compete on that type of level. So what we need to go is go to the basics. Like Slovakia, 20 years ago, said we have our competitive advantage in machinery industry, let's focus on car industry. Right now we have four OEMs and 350 suppliers. If you add it all together within the um, Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary, it's a cluster that will hopefully never move because we, are, we have competitiveness in this area. That's uh, what we should probably say that, okay, we will put our resources into something that will really work. And we have to start from the small decision and build around it the educational system, maybe the investment screening. If we are talking about AI, we cannot sell one <laughs> European company to any competitor because if we want to focus on this, let's do it this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I'm afraid that uh, too many opinions and too many interests are, um, are not making these decisions easy. That's a great point. Um, would anyone like to comment on where they think the EU should focus their energies for foreign investment? Um, What's, I mean, I've already said advanced manufacturing is a very obvious sector where, where, where we compete so well. Is there any, are we, anything to add on, on, on that point? 
Mr. Chovanec. Um, just alert, I, I heard this uh, automobile industry. Um, what I see that the automobile industry is under transformation. Um, and this transformation will profoundly affect the consumption and, uh, and, um, and the production of the car manufacturing. I see this region has put a lot of investment and efforts into the automobile industry. Suppose the sharing economy is really getting into scale from the consumption part. Suppose that the electricity car is replacing the traditional automobiles. What will happen with the industry? What will happen with the supply network and the distribution network? And what could be the industrial transformation, the way out, the way forward for those countries that are heavily invested in this industry? That's a question mark. Now, the way forward, is there any possibilities for the country to think ahead now that moving from the automobile industry gradually, traditional automobile industry, into the industrial robust manufacturing? It's related. I think this is forward thinking, and we know that the automobile industry is going to, to, to go a kind of a transformation. And we know that the pharmaceutical industry had its own global restructuring a few years ago for the last uh, five or six years. And, uh, and some emerging market economies took the opportunities on that. But I'm not really, uh, elaborating on the pharmaceutical industry. It's a big story, a long story. Steve, there are losers and, and, and gainers on that. Um, there's, I think time is up, so I just want to make a very, very critical point. The policy-driven global value chain restructuring, the policies has made firms, or forced the firms, to go for diversification in terms of geographical location of their global value chain location. And the firm's diversification creates the fragmentation of global value chain. And the fragmentation of global value chain creates the opportunities for countries in this region. Mm -hmm. Think further on that and deeper on that. That's what I just wish to offer as a takeaway. Thank you. You, you mentioned car industry and uh, also robots. And I will give you another example of uh, Slovenian reality. Uh, and why FDI can be really a stimulus and really, really good for, let's say, development of the countries like Slovenia. For example, we had investments of uh, Japanese companies, Yaskawa. They are now producing in Slovenia uh, industrial robots. This is a trigger, a trigger that we find out, okay, guys, let's, all, uh, let, let, let's make Slovenia as one of the hubs for industrial robots in the Europe. Now we decided this. And we are supporting now startups to work on this. We are supporting faculties working together with Institute Jozef Stefan on this. Of course, combining this with artificial intelligence, uh, making a, let's say, ecosystem that will promote, that will allow really to go to the next level of industrial robotics in Slovenia. Not only because of the Yaskawa, but the Yaskawa was a trigger. So foreign investor was a trigger to completely reshape our industrial, at least in one segment, industrial politics. And this is, I think, the way that we should treat foreign investors. To build on that, I think this is an exciting case. But if, if the country wants to develop further, it needs the backup of the whole Europe, European Union, because this industrial clustering is a must. Clustering not only backed up by manufacturing facilities, but also by human resources. Not only by human resources for manufacturing, but of human resources for providing the services of this. Imagine if you build all these industrial robbers, what you need is to, to get the market to lease them out. When you lease them out, you need the engineers to service on the spot. And that needs thousands of engineers to take care of these robbers wherever they are deployed. And that's not just for Slovenia. It's for Slovakia, for other countries altogether. This is a new clustering that needs to be built. 
with the leadership of European Union. Uh, I have to uh, react on the issue with the automotive industry that um, I would say that we should keep the common sense and not to get carried away. Right now or these days, politics is done on Twitter. You need mm -hmm. to have short messages that sound really good and are attracting a lot of attention. Uh, not so fast. We have heard many scenarios that uh, electromobility will take over the cars. It will, eventually, probably, but not in the cases or not in the numbers as it was declared. We have, as a country, all declared how, what will be the percentage of electric cars being bought in 2020. Nobody is going to fulfill it because we are not there yet. The same with, uh, with the sharing economy. Uh, let's just shrink the sharing economy to Uber. Uh, which is distru disrupting the industry, but uh, not much is being said about their 50 billion valuation that used to be 70. They wanted one, 100 billion uh, before their IPO, and the company has never made a profit. It's not something that can be feasible in real economic times. So what I think what we need to do to go back, and if we are talking about electromobility, let's look at the whole production uh, process from starting the battery till what will happen after it's all used. And if you look at the carbon footprint, you might find out that these technologies are not yet feasible mm -hmm. to, to make in a, in a huge masses. Of course, we are going to, to get there. I personally believe that within the 30, 40 kilometer uh, district around city, electromobility will lead maybe on long distance truck drives, but uh, maybe the future or the next step will be those hydrogen cars. But uh, until then, let's look also at the, at the economy and at the money, because if we start all investing into something that doesn't make profit, we, that, that's the race to the bottom. Yeah. It's, an, it's, just long. it's an exciting discussion. Um, yes, it is not now. Are we thinking of the time frame? The time frame is five years, it's 10 years. I guess it's less than 10 years. Five years, I don't know, the, the car industry's transformation. Secondly, <coughs> is there excess capacity for automobile industry? How serious it is now? Excess capacity and shrinking demand. So these are the factors we need to consider. If we consider it in the five years to 10 years time, the time frame, the action should be today. Not in five years. That's what I meant, forward looking. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, everybody, gentlemen. That was really great, a great discussion. And, and uh, yeah, thank you for listening and watching in on this panel, uh, Invest Talks to 3.0. I don't believe we have time for one or two questions, do we? We do? Okay, if anybody has a burning question to, to uh, posit one of our panelists, would they please raise their, their hands? Oh, have we stumped you all? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining, and until next time. Thank you.